Welcome to The Gray Report. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. And if you are a multifamily investor, you know, an aspiring investor, you're an industry insider, well, just, you know, strap yourself in because, again, we've got an excellent episode of The Gray Report today. We're doing another Gray Report newsletter roundup. Everything that happened in commercial real estate, multifamily, real estate, in the economy in general, kind of wrapping up what happened to keep you up to date. Um, we're bringing in Matt Bosnago again. He's a director of communication and marketing over at Gray Capital. Um, again, we're going to be breaking down the latest research reports, articles, blogs, opinions, all that good stuff that happened in commercial real estate. But if you um, are interested in this type of information, staying up to date, one, subscribe to this YouTube channel for the Gray Capital YouTube channel. Make sure you're signed up for the Gray Report newsletter at graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter and bookmark grayreport.com. We'll bring you all this information updated 24-7. Let's bring Matt Bosnagel in, Director of Communication and Marketing at Gray Capital. Matt, how you doing today? How is Indianapolis doing? Pretty good. Uh, the weather could be a little bit better, but you know, can't be can't be sunny every day. <laughs> mm, no, that's true. Can't control the weather just yet. That's right. Although, although, although we, we can try. I'm, I'm on location doing some uh, market research down here in Mexico. Um, Good. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm just seeing how the economy is doing, yeah. but uh, still trying to stay up to date with what is going on. Okay. So let's get right into the gray report newsletter. All right. So this week on the gray report, Multifamily confidence explodes. Confidence, a lot of interest from investors, from builders, from from renters. Um, you know, a lot of the economy is hot. Um, you know, what were you feeling? When you were uh, writing up this uh, headline: multifamily confidence explodes. Um, it's because the story this week is one about hope and confidence. It's been a tough year, so I think we're due for some confidence. There's positive job growth in all, almost all major markets in the country. Property values have increased across all commercial real estate sectors. Builders remain active even in the midst of elevated pr commodity prices. And for multifamily specifically, rising rents and valuations will continue to be a substantial aspect of the shift from recovery to growth that we're experiencing this year. I think there's a lot of reasons to be confident. And I, uh, I think it's time. <laughs> I think it's time to feel, to feel a little optimistic. Hey, you know, I I, I agree 100%. And it's like, kind of again, like get back on the boat because um, if you were paying attention to the fundamentals, like if you were, if you've been tracking from the Gray Report newsletter for the past year, you would have been confident throughout this entire period. Not that there were times of slight uncertainty, but, you know, understanding the fundamentals, you know, multifamily has got some pretty solid foot, footing. Um, regardless if there was, you know, an economic downturn, just because, you know, basic supply and demand, obviously if incomes, um, something happens, incomes and the economy, it's not good for any um, asset class, but we were relatively confident last year in 2020, but um, it's glad to see it solidify with all of the proof um, that's going on right now. So yeah. let's get into a snapshot of rates and markets. What is going on out there in the broader economy? What is going on with financing rates, 10-year treasury yield? Again, super flat rates. We're at 1.62. Again, you know, we've been basically between 1.5 and, you know, 1.6% 1 um, over the past several weeks. We really haven't been able to get out of that range. Um, and again, the U.S. 10-year treasury, it is, um, it's one of the most important uh, numbers in capitalism. It's with so much, so much debt. And credit is um, index two. It, it gives us an idea of inflation. Um, it's a very good idea of just, you know, what is the cost of capital out there? Um, so 1.62, it will keep reporting on it every week. 30 day LIBOR and SOFR, um, essentially unchanged. 30 day LIBOR at 0.09%, SOFR at 0.01%. Also, these are shorter term rates that other lands, the two year treasury spread, the difference between long term maturity debt and shorter term maturity debt coming at 1.46. And then uh, let's look at some actual apartment loan interest rates, HUD 223F clocking in at 2.65%. Um, I've heard reports that could be a little bit lower, lower but you know, we've kind of stayed in this you know, 1.4 to 1, uh, sorry, 2.4 to 2.6 range. Um, so we're kind of staying in that range as well. HUD 221D4, these are four new constructions. Again, 40 year term, 40 year amortization, clocking at three and a quarter percent. Um, and then the agencies, Fannie and Freddie. Um, and again, now these rates can vary depending on what market you're in, how long of term, how much interest only. Um, but the, some quotes that we've received from Fannie, 2.65%, then a Freddie, 2.9%. 
the iShares residential ETF, or res, you know, this tracks the multi um, apartments, publicly traded rates, clocking in at $83 per share. Spot price per gold per ounce, um, $1,908. The New York Stock Exchange Steel Index, clocking in at $1,859. Lumber, land, random length futures, clocking in at $1,330. Uh, crude oil coming in at $69 a barrel, Bitcoin, 37451 per coin, and Ethereum, 2709 per token. And we've got the broader S&P 500, um, you know, we're basically at all-time highs, $4,208 for the S&P 500. Again, you can hop on over to grayreport.com and track all this same information. Um, we've got it broken down between index is commodities. Um, we have uh, REITs that we'd like to track, cryptocurrencies. It's all right there in front of you. Then grayreport.com. Again, it's going to keep you up to date. Um, you're going to see a lot of the same articles, research reports um, popping up on the headlines. We've got videos, our market stats, you know, what's going on with REITs. Here's the res, um, a REIT property residential index. We've got Avalon Bay, Mid-America. Mid um companies we've got just, you know we track a lot of different things so hop on over and check it out but anyway matt what is going on we've got the national report may 12th of realtors um this is a great report we featured um, april's report recently and um again like a lot of good insights um what were some of your takeaways you want to start on the economic conditions or where would you like to start? yeah i i think uh, i wanted to start with this one as a nice overview um i like i like the uh the comparison that they have of the different um, of the different REITs, and uh, this report does include some notes on low rise apartments, which generally have better cap rates and are a growing part of total apartment sales. But I think that this graph that shows how sectors like self storage and industrial are taking off and and really kind of keep have keep going. Um, those are those are the ones that you can that you can really see. Um, it's in that commercial market overview. If you kind of scroll down right there yes that's the uh that's the one that i wanted to to kind of focus on you can see how you can see how lodging really is is down for a little while and now it's it's actually uh it's respect it goes from kind of the lowest performance to a respectable six percent gain which is above retail healthcare and multifamily. um it i like this chart just because it tells a little bit of a story and i know it doesn't tell <laughs> it's not completely accurate these are just lines on a you know, on a field, but you can see that you, you can kind of see when, um, when everything dipped and when industrial kept going. Um, and that's been the story really throughout the, the pandemic is the strength of industrial um, throughout the strength of industrial and its persistence throughout, even, it, even in the midst of, you know, other sectors that are kind of plummeting, um, that one's just kept going strong. Yep. No, that makes sense. I mean, everyone, uh, needed to get their toilet paper shipped to them last year and mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't slowed down i mean everyone's e-commerce um that last mile delivery very important and i think i'm curious you know if it's more of like a base effect with hospitality but it makes yeah. sense people are starting to travel again um i mean i'm traveling um so it, it, it makes a lot of sense and you know I, I recommend this is a great report it's about 20 pages it breaks in different um commercial real estate asset classes um, you know, the multifamily section, I think is interesting. I think Matt, you were talking about from the report, you know, really the low rise apartments are, um, in much more demand, a lot more transactions in low rise, more garden style apartments. And this is going to make sense. And it's going to kind of piggyback off of another article that we have about, um, kind of the donut effect of that, you know, people are going into the suburbs. They're not going into the CBDs. They're not going into the downtowns just yet. Um, I think, you know, there could even be an opportunity there, but I think I, if no one's really sure when that full recovery is going to take place. Yeah. So driving, um, everyone, everyone's trying to buy apartments. And so, but not sure if they want to buy an apartment downtown, buying it in the suburbs seems like a sure thing right now. Um, so it'll be interesting, um, because there may be some buying opportunities in some of those urban cores, um, if no one is paying attention. So let's, yeah. let's, let's keep tracking that. Okay. So next we've got construction is booming a construction boom is coming despite skyrocketing material prices um you know this is interesting we talked about this last week you know we see you know prices of steel the lumber they're going up people are still building and Bu said, builders keep building they keep going and it's not necessarily that it's not there it's just they're paying up for it so matt what was like globe street kind of breaking things down what's going on 
um, this yeah. construction boom? Yeah, some developers have, yes, understandably held off, but many have not. Um, and I think, you know, the, the article calls it a construction boom and multifamily projects are taking up the biggest portion of this boom. Over 45% of projects over $50 million were multifamily. Um, and I think that this connects with uh, with another article that I won't, that we may not have time to go into it, um, specifically, but I just wanted to reference it here, is these construction costs that are continuing to rise. This is what the construction industry is dealing with, but even then, and I said this last week, it's it's more of a finite problem. And the takeaway from this article is this is a quote. It says it is reasonable to conclude that lumber prices are in a bubble that is not likely to last indefinitely. And for steel, we can expect a correction where the price reverts somewhat, but remains above previous levels. So there is a light at the end of this tunnel. Um, and I think that uh, I, and regardless, regardless of whether there's a light at the end of the tunnel or not, people keep building. So um, I think this is just another uh, another reason to be confident, and um, another uh, another sign that some of the problems that we're ha that we're seeing on in the supply chain are not going to be forever. This is not going to go up and up and up and up. I I think yeah. that you know people are solving it. So it sounds like a short term issue. Um, yeah. You know, I think another one of the quotes is that um, you know it's over the next couple of months, it's reasonable to expect further upward pressure, but it's not going to be yet an indefinite. Yeah. The, the articles that we were seeing a couple months ago were all about, you know, how are we going to deal with this? How are we, oh no. And now it it's looking at the problem and it's actually describing maybe uh, a lot more specifically what the scope is and what it is instead of Kind of throwing your hands up in the air and saying this is a disaster and watch out everybody yeah and i i think people are getting creative too um yeah. you know i like i've this is again anecdotal notes but you know i've heard from some builders you know, even like home flippers who are like you know uh, these steel you know they're using steel studs and they're doing more steel frame construction because they're like well it's basically the same thing um as using lumber and uh it's not what we usually do but it's what's available and may even be cheaper yeah and same thing i mean even like um, like track track price as you know wood decking and it lasts like you know two decades longer or whatever so it's mm -hmm. it's allowing people to you are actually the the quality is going up since you know lumber is so expensive or at least you know that would be that's the idea so it's it's interesting you know people adapt and um, it'll be interesting you know do people kind of stick to some of these you know maybe people start you know, hey we started using steel studs and more steel frame construction and yeah. we like doing it it's for whatever reason if the cost is similar they're just going to keep doing that so it's interesting some of these long-term effects even if prices kind of come back to equilibrium what are those long-term effects mm -hmm. yeah and and then so I think this all piggy's piggy's back piggybacks because everyone was talking about you know, lumber, steel, gas, everything's raising in prices. We talked about yeah. inflation. You know, what does this mean? Real estate is at a hedge. And um, Matt, what, what do you think was JLL getting at a generation of investors? You know, I don't want to ring it. Like, I don't want to ring the inflation bell as, as loudly as I was in earlier weeks, but I still want to ring that bell. The bell's still there. It's a real bell. And and another quiet reminder, you know, like you said, you know, somebody look at the current conditions and say, Oh, there's no inflation. It's just a temporary increase in the price of computer chips and lumber and steel and gas and also copper and used cars and ham. Ham prices are up. Well, I don't boys think anyone's saying there's no inflation. I think people are just saying, oh, this is just a temporary, you know, at least, you know, I think there's two camps. There's the, the, the Jerome Powell's and the central bankers who have seen, you know, so little inflation over the past decade or so, even when they were trying to create inflation that more Janet Yellen, but still, you know, he, all the central bankers in the mix. And they're saying that this is a transitory spike of inflation, a quick move up because of all the supply bottlenecks, all the everything that happened during COVID-19. Then there's people in the other camp that are saying that this is going to lead to long term, you know, elevated levels of inflation. And, you know, what JLL is asking is, you know, the Federal Reserve has moved from a targeted 2% inflation to an average 2% inflation over time, not understanding when that window, that period is that they're going to, um, you know, uh, extract that average number. Um, but, you know, they're basically saying if we're going to kind of go in year over year, 
we're at like 1.6%. We had 4.2% inflation in April yeah. annualized. And so we're, we're at 1.6. We're not too far away, but we still have 40 basis points to go till we hit that two mark. And on the, at least on the average side, and they still want to get to, you know, full employment. And we're really only halfway. I mean, so we're 40 basis points away to 2% average inflation. But if you look at, you know, the participation rate, we're only halfway there. You know, and I don't, I'm not, I don't think it's this article. We'll, we'll, we'll show another article later that goes into that in detail. But, um, you know, it's the big question. It, the Federal Reserve is playing this game of chicken right now with inflation. And they're continuing to, you know, push on, push on, push on, not let, letting up the gas. But people are starting to get shaky hands and trying to see if they're going to swerve. Um, we've seen the overnight window um, at the Fed. We've seen some disruptions. A lot of major hedge funds, major institutional capital is going into those, the, those overnight, overnight windows um, in much larger volumes than we saw in the past, um, indicating that there may be, they might be raising some of those overnight rates, which is kind of like the, the absolute shortest term kind of maturity um, mm. facility. And so, you know, our, that could be an indication that the Fed may start thinking about thinking about raising that Fed funds rate at some point here in the future, seeing that 2% average rate um, kind of in the periphery, getting pretty close. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I like I said, I, I'm not, uh, I don't think that it's going to be runaway inflation, but I do think that the confluence of these price elevations um, however temporary each one may be, is having an effect. Uh, I think there is enough price increases that their aggregate impact is going to be felt in the general economy. Um, and I think this is, it's connected to what the Fed is doing. But I also think that it, it seems like we're entering an environment that is recovering um, still. And part of that is probably going to be increased prices. Without a doubt. And, and, and we kind of deviated from kind of the point of this article. And, and we talked a little bit about on the last recap um, from, I think, the 28th of May. But, you know, not all real estate is as an appropriate a hedge against inflation as other types of real estate. Multifamily is a excellent um, hedge against inflation, especially large commercial real, uh, multifamily. You've got, um, you know, many uh, units. You're, you're releasing constantly. So you're able to track inflation, you know, essentially by, you know, almost daily as the price of, it, of the volatility dollar decreases, prices um, elevate. Not all asset classes are created equally as a hedge, but there are investors, um, not just in real estate, but they're looking for places to at least track, if not um, beat inflation. And so, you know, residential real estate is a great um, vehicle for that. You know, people are looking at other hard assets, real assets, um, gold, silver, and then, you know, cryptocurrencies um, as another way to hedge against inflation. Also, you know, more value industrial oriented, um, you know, stocks and equities. Um, we, we talked about this, you know, major rotation out of more of the high growth technology stocks into more value based um, investments. Yeah. In general, real estate is one of those. So it, it, it makes sense. And that's going to, again, it's this, it's a you know, cyclical thing. You know, it's, it's going to continue to raise those prices as well. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit of a self fulfilling prophecy in a way. Mm -hmm. All right, so Bercadia, let's get on to the next report, Bercadia. Yeah, uh, I think that the, the Class A apartment trends, this, this report is an interesting development. I think it's a good sign for the apartment market in general, um, that Bercadia report. Um, these mm -hmm. trends show Class A properties with performance that, that's improving better than Class B and C properties. Um, but I think I'm kind of a little bit skeptical that this trend is due to a K-shaped recovery, and they didn't mention that, but it, you could see that at first glance and, and assume that. Um, I think it's more of an adjustment from a year of volatility. Class A apartments still have the lowest numbers in terms of year-over-year -year rent change, which is negative 1.7 compared to negative 0.5 for Class B and flat numbers for Class C properties. So I think Class A performance is more of this snapback um, to the typical pricing pre-COVID. Um, you know, I think in terms it, it, in terms of rent change, it, it looks like it's it looks like it's really galloping upwards, but ultimately year over year, there still is some room for class A to grow a lot more room um, comparatively than the class B or C properties. Yeah, I think yep, I, that makes sense. There's a little more runway on the class A. It makes sense because, 
you know, pandemic happened, people didn't really want to move. They've got all these class A properties that, um, well, they may have been in a lease up. They may have been constructed in the past year. They may have mm -hmm. been, you know, 40, 50, 60% occupied. Um, but all of a sudden, no one's moving. No one wants to tour apartments. Um, so they, they're, not, they're not raising rents. They're, in, they're probably lowering rents to attract new residents, giving off concessions. You know, here's a month of free rent. Here's a, you know, $2,000 gift card. Here's a free TV, all kinds of you know, crazy stuff. But um, that's what was going on last year. But now all of a sudden people are moving again. People are like, hey, you know what? I kind of, I'm, I'm sick of, um, you know, this small B class studio. I want to move into an A class studio or a one bedroom A class. I'm making a little more money. My, my pay, my salary has been increased by 10, 20% as you know, we've seen in a lot of cases. Um, and yeah. we're just seeing the rollout of these new class A apartments and also, you know, class A rent growth, um, new construction it, it, it's not necessarily it's not like a property always raise the rents by 10 percent it's it sometimes it's a new property was built and they're leasing up and their rents are you know 15 percent more than you know the older comp and so that average increase over the market in class a is, is a big number because of just where the new rent levels are at the new yeah, of the new construction so i think there's probably a little bit in here mm -hmm. and then also we got to have to remind ourselves again all these primary markets that just um, really lag behind the rest of the country last year, especially the class A stuff. That's where we saw the pricing devaluations and the huge rent declines. And anytime we look at a nat national surveys for rent for markets, those primary markets, the New York cities, the Los Angeles the Seattle's, they are going to move that needle so much more than a lot of the smaller secondary and tertiary markets that a lot of apartment investors, at least that like, like us are focused on kind of like that middle market group, you know, most, a lot of apartment syndicators, whereas like, you know, the REITs and the major institutions, they may be more focused on those primary gateway markets of you know, the New York's and Los Angeles's. Yeah. That second page of that, uh, of that report kind of outlines some of the cities that are, um, that are seeing these rent changes and, um, the the real all stars, you know, you, you hear a lot about Las Vegas and and Phoenix, um, but right there in the five to ten percent range is some nice, you know, smaller, smaller than Gateway, uh, but but really, you know, their Indianapolis is in there. Um, you've got Salt Lake City and um, and Jacksonville. These are these aren't you know your Gateway markets, but they're but they're doing. But they're doing very well, I think, and it's just another example of you know there's there's some other markets out there. You don't have to always look at the coasts or or the gateway cities. Yep, I think yep, I think I think it's pretty illustrative. Um, and like we said, yeah, the New Yorks, um, San Francisco's, um, you know, more than five percent rent decline. I guess Los Angeles is you know uh, between zero and negative five percent. Um, yeah. This, this all makes sense. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any markets on there that I'm kind of surprised that are surprising, um, but it re really, really not at all. I mean, maybe Denver a little bit, like, but I guess Denver. Yeah. Again, this is an issue of you know Denver is a, such a hot market, um, a tons of migration. So many people moving to Colorado, but um, I think this is maybe a more of a story of oversupply. You can have a ton of demand, but still oversupply in the short term, even if the long term fundamentals make a ton of sense. Yeah. Uh, so again, it's, it's all about finding that balance. Um, a lot of demand, but not too much supply where you're going to oversupply. So mm -hmm. it's always good to know. Okay, let's continue to move on. Um, let's see what, um, the, you know, I think this is an interesting um, piece from the National Bureau of Economic Research, the donut effect of COVID-19 on cities. Um, Matt, I know you were really... Um, you want to talk about this. Yeah, so while you looks, download that PDF, I can I can give a little bit of a spiel. Oh, wait, it's done. <laughs> um, the beer, the report from the National Bureau of Economic Research looks at the migration patterns during the pandemic, and it finds that people were more likely to move from the city to the suburbs than they were to move from a big city to a smaller city. Um, I've talked about this oh, before. Say, say, Matt, Matt, say just say that again because I think that, I think that's really critically. It's a good. It's a new insight. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're just repeat that for everybody. Yeah. People were more likely to move from the city to the suburbs than they were to move from a big city to a smaller city. Um, I got this one wrong. I said it here before that I thought that downtowns would bounce back and would see more lasting movement to smaller markets with a lower cost of living. 
Now, the study is not the definitive statement on the issue, and I'd like to see some more information on net migration to and from primary and secondary markets, but their reasoning makes sense. It's not going to be 100% work from home future where you do your job in whatever city you want, but if working conditions are partly remote with a hybrid model, then people aren't going aren't, to aren't going to be making the decision to move to another city. Instead, they're probably going to decide that it may make sense to move to the suburbs, get a little more space and deal with a longer drive to work for those two to three days where you show up to office in person. Um, I don't think that, uh, you know, when it's framed in that way, I think it makes a lot of sense. I, I still think that there is probably some movement to smaller markets. I just, uh, I, I don't think that it's, it's captured that strongly in this, in this report. So mm -hmm. I will, I will eat my words. Well, no, I don't. I don't think you were wrong, man. I, th I think that I mean people were moving from you know those primary markets to smaller markets. Also, yeah, and that moving out to the suburbs is a little bit more palatable. Pe pe people don't like change. People don't like that big of a change. Yeah, we're going through a pandemic. They didn't have enough change. Moving to an entire different city. That that's that's a lot to figure out in the midst of a pandemic. But moving out to the suburbs. I think wrong. I mean, we do because we do have the migration data. We do have the you know the U-Haul statistics. A lot of us more high frequency um, information. People were absolutely moving from primary markets to you know smaller markets. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of people were also just moving out to the suburbs. Um, you know, okay, I was in you know Manhattan, you know, but now I'm going to move out to you know Westchester County or Long Island or going to go out to New Jersey. Um, I mean, the biggest example, I think, is, you know, like, okay, Los Angeles and, you know, Inland Empire, a lot of those, those cities kind of outside of LA, yeah. kind of Inland California, I mean, Inland Empire has had, you know, the highest demand, highest rent growth, absolutely on fire. If they didn't have crazy politics and laws and such a landlord unfriendly state, you know, it'd be an attractive market to invest in. But so much demand, so much rent growth. And it's not that they're going to, um, they're not all, but they're, they are going to Boise. Idaho. They yeah. are going to Tucson, but some people are also just going to Inland Empire, which I assume they're considering as like a suburb of Los Angeles. And, and the other Tucson. story that that I think is a is a factor in this, uh, the smaller cities, there wasn't much of a change. People for for gateway markets, yes, there was a move to the suburbs, but the smaller cities actually had relatively little movement to the suburbs um, compared. And, and the tertiary cities really had a, almost no movement from downtown to the suburbs. So that may be- uh, Is there like, what it, there is, they're like, we kind of already live in a suburb or it's not- Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, super dense anyway. Yeah. That, that, I think that, that's, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, th those are all really good insights. And again, it kind of begs this question. We talk about it and, and it's a- it, it's critical uh, of our, you know, our, how are downtowns, central business districts, how are they going to recover into what level? Is it going to be a full bounce back? And is that going to be, again, the, is it going to be a multi-decades long trend now that the suburbs, they've got all these cities, they've got all the amenities, they've got the shopping, the retail, the the food, the entertainment, they've got, they've, built, they've been building it out there. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's a little bit sad because, you know, we, so many cities had been beat up for so long. You know, over the past 10 or 15 years, we've seen this resurgence of cities and neighborhoods um, kind of revitalizing areas. I mean, that was one of the things that got me excited getting into real estate is like, you know, kind of helping to revitalize parts of um, Indianapolis. But we're not, you know, no one wants to live there anymore. That's not really an option. And now it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with the suburbs. I mean, it's not like a us versus them, downtown versus the suburbs. It's all good. But um, I, it'd be nice if it was a little bit more balanced i guess but uh yeah we'll, yeah we'll have to see we'll have to see okay another great article and again we're not covering everything that's in the great report newsletter like we get matt and i before we start these shows we're like okay there's a lot of good stuff matt's like i want to cover this that all these great articles all these great stats i'm like matt no one <laughs> wants to listen to us for an hour um, we, we, we got to pick and choose um even though i'm the one most of the time going off on these crazy tangents but anyway, Globe Street, Amazon's outside impact on industrial real estate. Matt, what's the takeaway? Yeah, I was I was kind of thinking that while you were talking about um, while you're talking about these lasting changes, and I think one of the one of the ones that might that may actually have an impact on you know what which of these markets are going to grow is not is is e-commerce. Um, e-commerce is driving a lot of the growth in industrial real estate and logistical hubs. I think like Indianapolis, which is another article that we mentioned in here, uh, they stand to benefit. I think this seems like a growing trend. 
and one that is directly related to factors like traffic congestion and proximity to other markets. And I think these factors are also relevant to multifamily. So um, I, I was trying to get a get a feel on what percentage of industrial real estate is actually tied up in logistics and warehouses. Um, I couldn't get an exact figure to that, but it seems like- Versus like like hard industrial, like- Yeah, so I was looking into it and and so there's there's flex space, there's manufacturing, and then there's things that are related to logistics like warehouses and distribution centers. And and, And my big question, um, that I'm that I'm looking into right now is how much of a percentage is warehouse space compared to those other kind of uh, manufacturing spaces. Um, I think because, it's a pretty high percentage. Yeah, yeah. It seems like that's the one. That's the area that's really growing, and 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 places that are poised to do that kind of distribution work rather than maybe uh, the manufacturing work. That's the story that I'm hearing. It's not necessarily that we're that we're building things. We're we're moving them around. And we're moving them around a lot more than we used to. Yeah. Well, and then and it's really Amazon is driving all of it. I mean, it's it's e-commerce in general, but Amazon is a one. It's like literally like okay, Amazon's Amazon's got a new distribution facility here, there, 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 yeah. and there, and it's pretty incredible. Well, and when you look at markets now, you have to look at things like how close is another big city? How what's the traffic going to be like? How you know how close is it to an airport? And that's you know that may have a really big impact on the general success of that company, they may not have that economic boost from the logistic from logistics if they don't have those that kind of infrastructure in place already. Yeah. I mean, I would love to find a property, you know, kind of in immediate proximity to kind of one of these e-commerce hubs near an airport, near a lot of these um, you know, fulfillment centers, because yeah. that's going to be a hotbed for job. It would to find that would wouldn't that be something? I it would I, I can't even imagine. Um, not, not hinting at anything there, (laughs) but, um, okay, let's hop on over to real page again. You know, I, I, real page puts out a lot of great stuff. Mm -hmm. Annual employment change turns positive for most markets. Yeah. So the, the final article that I highlighted here, um, kind of further characterizes the conditions we're in right now. Jobs are improving. The economy is growing and, and, and I don't want to be cautiously optimistic. I just want to be optimistic. I know that the most successful... So throw caution to the wind, Matt. Let's yeah. just, let's just see, I know this in. most successful clickbait headlines say things like ultimate financial implosion or maybe something biblical like the seventh seal has been opened and it's not great for Wall Street. But <laughs> or, or, or a good, you know, uh, both the family confidence explodes, but it's, it's all good. It, 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 you know, it's what works. Yeah, yeah. Right. Call me a rebel, but I like good news better than bad news. And I think that this is, it's just another, the fundamentals behind the commercial real estate industry are looking great. Um, I think that we're solving a lot of the problems. I think there's a lot of good reasons to be confident this week. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Matt. I would agree. Um, I usually say 100%. Let's just give it a thousand percent. This has been a great um, recap for the Gray Report newsletter. Again, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Make sure you sign up for the Gray Report. Um, you're going to have to go over just to graycapitalllc.com. It's not too difficult. Graycapitalllc.com. Um, there is going to be a button there. It's going to say sign up for a free multi free weekly multifamily report. You're going to click that. You're going to fill out a little bit of information and hold on one second. Hey, Alex. All right. So you're going to go on over to graycapitalllc.com. You're going to um, you know, just give us your email address. That's all we need. But if you just like to stay up to date all the time on multifamily news, reports, articles, podcasts, videos, again, grayreport.com, the premier multifamily intelligence aggregator. Um, Again, you can see a lot of these articles, a lot of these research reports. And and again, this is not just kind of fluff, you know, a couple paragraphs, articles here and there. You know, we've put a lot of time in finding not just, you know, news articles and blogs and opinion pieces, but really kind of, you know, deep, hard research that's going to give you that depth of knowledge that's going to allow you to make just more nuanced and informed decisions because, you know, as they say, knowledge is power. And as Benjamin Disraeli once said, the man with the best information is the most successful in life, not just a bunch of information, a um, bunch of data points. you got to kind of put it together. And that's what um, these recaps are. We're trying to give some contextualization to what's happening in the market, connecting the dots and trying to paint a somewhat clearer picture, at least adding some color to the black and white landscape that often surrounds us. Um, so let's go down the list. 
sign up for the Gray Report newsletter. Make sure you bookmark the Gray Report, grayreport.com. And then the last thing, if you're like, all right, I like what I'm seeing here, guys. What is happening? What can I do? I need to get allocated. Inflation is coming. I want to participate. I want to allocate towards multifamily assets. Well, this isn't a solicitation to invest in absolutely anything. None of this is investment advice. Advice. You want to be a fool to take any of this as an investment advice to invest in anything. That being said, there is a thing called the Great Capital Investment Club. And so if you hop on over to greatcapitalllc.com, you click that join the club button, um, you're going to see a video of me kind of explaining things. Um, but you've already got, I'm explaining to you right now. You don't need to click the video. Just come on down here and apply. You've just got a couple things you have to fill out. And so some of the benefits of joining the Great Capital Investment Club, some people just think, just want my email address to send me deals. And yeah, you're going you're gonna to see the deals from us. That's why you're joining the investment club but there's a lot more that goes into it. So we have these free investment strategy sessions and these are not sales calls. These are good, you know, 45 minute to an hour deep dives into what you're doing in real estate, analyzing your goals and objectives, what your investment criteria is, you know, and some investors, they know exactly what they're looking for and we can help refine that or, you know, kind of just make sure they're on the right track. Other investors, they're not exactly sure if they're still developing that criteria. Maybe they have got a couple of single family homes, some duplexes. They're trying to think, you know, is syndication right for me? We kind of walk them through that. And we're not going to just say invest with great capital. That's not the point of this at all. Often on an investment strategy session, the conclusion is, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing something great. Why would you stop what you're doing? Other times it's you're trying to get some of that time back. You're putting all this time into running these duplexes, the, you know, single family rentals, and you, again, you don't like being a day-to-day -day landlord. You want a more passive opportunity. And we kind of help you just kind of paint that picture, chart that course of what that could look like, um, you know, over time. Um, maybe you're trying to diversify a portfolio and you're like, be the stock market actually sent. I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. I'd much rather have, you know, 20 to 40% of my net worth allocated to cash flow and commercial real estate, we can help you kind of, again, put that blueprint together. Um, and that's something that we do after these investment strategy sessions, we will actually create a document we call the portfolio blueprint. Um, and that basically will say, you know, over a period of time, taking a systematic approach to allocating yourself to multifamily real estate, this is what that portfolio can look like. You maybe hear some projected returns based on past performance over to greatcapitallc.com, join the club and schedule an investment strategy session with us. There's all kinds of other benefits to join the club, but that, I think those investment strategy sessions are the biggest one. And, and you're not limited to one. I mean, we'll have an, clients and investors you know, do one every, um, every month, just kind of stay up to date and make sure everybody's on track. So, all right, this has been an excellent, excellent rendition of the Gray Report newsletter. My name is Spencer Gray. I'm the president of Gray Capital. Uh, Matt Bosnagel, he's the director of communications and marketing at Gray Capital. Matt, thank you again for working on the newsletter. Thank you for coming on the Gray Report, giving us a rundown, breaking it all down for us. Thank um, you. I really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. I'll this has you. been another recap for the Gray Report newsletter. I'm your host, Spencer Gray. Have a good one. Thank you.